Released on March 23, 1960 in Japan, Aru-kyo-haku, known as Intimidation in English, was the 11th film by director Kuryoshi Kurahara. It marked not only the entrance of arguably the most successful decade in the young director's career, given that he would go on to direct 17 films between 1960 and 1969, but also a notable point in Japanese crime cinema. The film runs short at a brisk 65 minutes, and was filmed in crisp black and white by cinematographer Yoshihiro Yamazaki, who had worked previously with Ko Nakahira, Seijun Suzuki, and Kurahara, and who would later provide his eye for Kon Ichikawa, Yasuharu Hasebe, Yoshishige Yoshida, and others. Its score was composed by Masaru Sato, who had worked with Kurahara prior, as well as providing the soundtracks to a number of Akira Kurosawa's films. While this package may sound enticing enough, you may be surprised to find that below the surface of this terse, hard-bitten noir narrative, there's a surprising depth of social commentary to be had. Join us today as we explore Kuryoshi Kurahara's Intimidation. Intimidation revolves around a pair of men who have known one another since childhood. Takita, the more well-to-do of the pair, is up for a promotion in the bank where both of the men work. Nakaike, on the other hand, is considered by Takita and their local boss alike to be a bit simple. Even Nakaike's sister, Yukie, holds a bit of a grudge against Nakaike. Yukie was in a relationship with Takita for years, only to be left for the boss's daughter. With marriage in the cards, Takita is moving out of town to climb the corporate ladder and cozy up to the head honcho. Before he can skip town though, Takita becomes embroiled in a blackmail plot. A third man, Kumaki, says he knows Takita has been sleeping with his wife and offers evidence that Takita has been cooking his bank books and giving fraudulent loans in order to advance. Kumaki asks for 3 million yen, and fast, putting a clock on Takita. Takita weighs his options to acquire the money given that he's not actually all that wealthy himself. As Kumaki suggests, no lighthouse shines on itself, meaning that no one would suspect Takita of stealing the money given his occupation. All the while, the film explores the dynamic between the once friends turned rivals present in Takita and Nakaike. As we will see with the remainder of the films we'll be covering from Kurahara, intimidation pretends to be one thing, but offers a subversive line of meaning below this sleek veneer. The film purports to be a noir story, bouncing between the interpersonal drama of two men split by the woes of the world and the intrigue present in Kumaki's blackmail plot. In truth, if we dig a little deeper, the film appears to be a set of statements on the class struggle present within the economic upswing occurring in this era of Japanese history. We are essentially presented with two camps, the haves and the have-nots, as represented by our leading men, Takita and Nakaike. Within the first scene, we are introduced to both men and given information concerning their backgrounds and their current positions which helps paint this dichotomy. Takita is marrying into a wealthy family, and we're made aware that he is advancing his career through nepotism. Meanwhile, Nakaike's sister being jilted by Takita in his lust for wealth indicates that their family has no means of upward economic or class mobility. In this dynamic, we can perceive that their stations in life are set at this point. At the farewell and congratulatory party for Takita, the local bank boss is shown to respect the young upstart. The boss, in spite of outranking Takita for the remainder of his station here, defers to his opinion when Takita calls Nakaike slow. Takita expresses here that he will stand up for Nakaike only in a backhanded way. They may have been friends in childhood, but they've grown apart socially to the point that association with Nakaike might bring Takita's reputation down. Takita can thus save Nakaike from the boss's ire by demeaning him. But as we will learn when the going gets truly rough, Takita handily throws Nakaike under the bus without a second thought. At this party, we meet Takita joking around with his boss and co-workers. We then transition to Nakaike, who is backstage, warming sake with his sister and other women brought to wait on the party. This is shown as a decidedly unmasculine station in the eyes of Takita and his ilk, given the lack of women seated at the banker's banquet and the abundance of them in service. This scene also establishes Yukie's growing disdain for her brother. Takita marrying the boss's daughter meant that she lost her lover. It also means that Nakaike did not swoop in on the daughter in order to propel their family upward. Now she is left with nothing, a fate that Nakaike shares. 
Yet, Nakaike knows that in order to have a second chance and growth, or perhaps to simply keep an old friend, he must remain differential to Takita. We see Nakaike asking Takita out drinking, something Yukie calls spineless thanks to Takita's harsh treatment of her brother. In the film's opening moments, we see plainly this economic and class divide between our two leads. It's only as the plot advances that we see what this divide means for our main men and the manners in which they perceive and react to this difference. In fact, while Nakaike seems somewhat upset at his lower standing, as shown in acts like asking his abusive superior out for drinks, it is actually Takita who explicitly breaks from convention and expresses disenchantment with his wealth and power. Later in the film, we join the two men as they drink together. Takita is the one to break away and emotionally reminisce about the wheat fields that used to grow up around their town. He goes on to bemoan the gentrification occurring in their once small town, almost seeming as though he pines for simpler times. Yet, when in the presence of their bosses, Takita would never have this sort of outburst, acting cool and collected, as though he couldn't be happier with his life. This shows that Takita and Nakaike might actually want the same things in life, but that they can't pursue them due to their different paths. Takita due to the restraint of social expectation, and Nakaike due to his lack of opportunity. Yukie brings this up too when she says she and Takita dated for eight years. She's not just upset at being left alone, but more importantly, because she felt that her and Takita's connection was one of genuine love. She laments on the night before Takita's departure that they should have started a family, but that tomorrow they'll be strangers. Though this is Yukie's perspective, one would hope she had known Takita's character and desires after nearly a decade of romance. If we assume her position to be true, we can see that Takita is throwing away personal happiness for his career. In fact, we see further evidence of this when Takita damages Nakaike's reputation to save himself. When Nakaike is put under the microscope for a mishap at the bank, Takita again gives Nakaike a prodding partially to save his old friend from the boss's wrath. More importantly, he must go a bit further this time, and he actually blames the mishap on Nakaike, where earlier he was simply demeaning Nakaike's intelligence. Takita is seen here feigning anger at Nakaike while speaking to their boss, yet when he gets out of sight of the other bank employees, Takita becomes visually shaken. He's betraying his friend for personal advancement in the most direct manner yet. This much about the film indicates Kudahara and company's consciousness regarding class and how it affected life in Japan at the time. What is perhaps more telling is the way in which this class divide is explored in a borderline satirical manner, showing that the disparity in wealth and status between our two leads is not indicative of their respective knowledge or skills. In fact, the reason we call this almost satirical is that intimidation seems to imply that with Takita and Nakaike, as well as some of the other higher-ups in the bank, there is in fact an inverse correlation between class and ability. During a scene in which Takita is deep in thought about the method and implications of potentially robbing the bank at which he works, the same boss who earlier spoke ill of Nakaike for his simpleness jovially admits that he has no idea how the bookkeeping and loans work at his own bank. His station is above his competency level, which, as we will see, becomes a recurring theme in the film. For example, Takita, on the other hand, knows well enough how to do his job to fake it. Whether or not he could do the job without handicaps, who knows, he's competent enough to know where potential exploits lie, such as how he needs to get Nakaike drunk while on night guard duty, where the instructions for opening the vault are, how to press Nakaike into opening the vault himself, and knowing to cut the alarm wire. Yet, as we see during this tense, almost wordless sequence, Takita doesn't know enough to commit the robbery himself. He can't open the bank vault on his own, relying on cue cards containing instructions and codes which are stored in his desk. Takita is also shown to be conceited as he makes the weakest attempt to conceal his identity, thinking either that his best friend since childhood won't believe Takita would have robbed him in the first place, or that he truly wouldn't recognize Takita. This is compounded when Takita forgets the clock specifically given to him as a gift on his own desk. He is so incompetent and brazen he even goes in without sunglasses after breaking a lens, rather than just buying another pair. 
And if it was too late for him to buy another pair, then why didn't he have a second pair on hand? As well as not even realizing the gun provided by Kumaki is empty. It never occurred to him to even try the gun out. In a sick parallel to mundane life, Takita forces Nakiike to commit the robbery for him. Nakiike follows orders from a man so incompetent he doesn't even know how to rob his own bank, and in turn takes the fall when the robbery is discovered. Takida abuses his station to claim that he was quote-unquote testing the bank, similar to how IT companies will stress test their security by hiring programmers to attempt to break in. And like some of these companies, Takida comments in a staff meeting after the robbery attempt that the whole company is at fault, but mostly Nakaike still. He calls attention to the incompetence nonetheless, asking that if their patrons knew about the incident, who would possibly trust them with their money? This world of incompetence and powerful men fraudulently achieving this power is perhaps best encapsulated with another exchange, this time between Takita and a construction boss. As we learn, Takita gave a faulty loan to the construction boss, and this loan went on to win his company a certain amount of success. Takita goes to the boss, thinking that this mutual history of crime will make the boss sympathetic to Takita needing the extortion money. As it turns out, this man who is portrayed as a hick among the bankers has now gained the upper hand. He understands better than Takita that in their world of fraud and backstabbing, there are no second chances. He instead suggests that his debt has been settled, given that he never reported Takita's part in the fraud, and goes on to imply that Takita is no more than a stranger to him now. Takita has lived his life conniving, and his chickens have come home to roost. He was perhaps too idealistic to think he could ever get screwed by the system he has believed in, and helped to propagate at the expense of others. The only things that might save him at this point are luck or nepotism. As luck would have it, when Takita goes to confront Kumaki about his debt, Kumaki accidentally dies, nullifying their agreement. Soon after, Takita is set to finally leave town and move up with a clean slate. Chance and nepotism have gotten Takita everything, mostly thanks to privilege from earlier in life. He has a university degree, placing him above Nakaike in the bank hierarchy to begin with. Nakaike is accordingly shown to be doomed thanks to lacking these opportunities and privileges. At the close of Intimidation, we find Takita on a train bound for his new hometown and place of work. All seems to be right in the world for him. He escaped fault for attempting to rob a bank, his enemy has died, and in an accident no less, meaning he isn't at fault, he has a new bride whose father will provide him with more wealth and opportunity, and he can finally put behind him his childhood friend and ex-lover, both of whom he has royally screwed in his ascent. At the last minute, we encounter Nakiike, who corners Takita and gives him a gloating speech. Nakiike explains that he's been aware of Takita's misdeeds this whole time. He's gone so far as to quit his job and move alongside Takita, filling the role Kumaki occupied for a short while. He will become a perpetual blackmailer, starting a new life where he will live off of Takita's wealth. If Takita refuses at any point, Nakiike will immediately spill the beans, ending Takita's life as he knows it. At the close of this conversation, a police officer appears, leaving both men shocked. Both of the new lives they had envisioned have been cut short before they could begin. The film then leaves us to ponder, what does society do with men like Takita, who flaunt the mores and folkways, and even the laws of their land? Do we let them go, and not let them rule our lives in fear? As Yukie might be accepting that Takita has become a stranger, do we doggedly pursue them and not let them know peace for their crimes, as Nakaike was prepared to do? Or do we find some sort of middle ground? After all, Nakaike knows all about Takita, knows that he's racked with debt and only pretending to be wealthy, that he intended to actually rob the bank, even while he plays at ignorance and shock. But the film asks, what can Nakaike do against a man as powerful as Takita without possessing any power himself? This threat from Nakaike is enough to get Takita to try and bribe Nakaike with a promotion, to which Nakaike laughs, saying he wants a life, not a job. The cruel irony is that this new life that Nakaike seeks will be subsidized by Takita, as a response to his reckless avarice. This is his comeuppance. Yet, is this existence, the one to be led by Nakaike and previously led by Kumaki, really a life? The message here seems a bleak one. 
that quote-unquote great people like Takita have easier access to power which they can then abuse, and many of them are likely imposters if not full-on poster children of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Folks like Nakaike, on the other hand, will always be held down, and may only advance through conniving and scheming, until their opportunity is taken from them, as it is with the police officer here. Perhaps most important, and most bleak, this message would indicate that in the push for personal greatness, the wrongdoing of people like Takita extends far beyond themselves. By the film's close, Takita has ruined not just his own life, but also the lives of Kumaki, Yukie, Nakaike, his new wife, and likely countless more who have been impacted by proxy. Intimidation is a gritty, calculated noir film which comments directly and critically on the divide between the low and high classes present in Japan at the dawn of the 1960s. It doesn't pull any punches in how it presents the abuse suffered by Nakaike at the hands of his old friend Takita, and the system at large. Nor does it hold back when exploring how this system of lies, deceit, and bravado has broken down the life of its presumptive antagonist. No one comes out of this narrative clean, tinging the entire affair with a sense of moral ambiguity and leaving the audience questioning just who to trust or who to believe at day's end. In 65 short minutes, Koreyoshi Kurahara and company display their artistic and narrative prowess, setting the stage for perhaps the most important decade in this young creator's storied career. Mm -hmm.